interesting. Very nice. Ah, oh, what's the weather like? How are you guys? It's sunny here in downtown Sydney, St. Leonard's. Uh, in my basement, it's uh, cold and damp. Is it? <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to Broadcast Central uh, homeschooling, working from home style. I'm down in the basement working so that uh, our homeschool teenagers are, have got the rest of the house to themselves. You know, that's one of the things that one of um, my team um, reports back her daughter learns bass and is also a, a singer and has her singing lessons and her bass lessons in the now office space for her and her husband and it's quite extraordinary that there's another layer of scheduling meetings around rehearsal time and lesson time now we, we've had we've already had a tuba exam this morning 11 45 was the tuba technical exam and uh yesterday we had double band rehearsal and my wife is taking her band rehearsal this afternoon. So it's always a bit of a scheduling issue around noise control in the house as well. And how did the exam go? He says he was, he said he did well. So yeah. we'll, uh, we'll have a debrief over dinner and find out. How old is said teenager? How old are you? <laughs> oh, high school age. So, high school uh, age. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Very cool. I remember music exams. I played piano and um, oh, music exams used to just, woo, woo. I can't imagine doing a music exam in around, <laughs> especially around COVID. Oh my God. Anyway, Jason, you look like you are out in the country. You're in the country somewhere. No. Not, not in the country. I'm out, out Westway, but uh, it's a good day to be working from outside, obviously. Bright blue sky. Not like Susan in the basement. So we've got basement and outside. Very nice. So. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm in the garage. It doesn't have that dampness to it, but uh, we are hitting the afternoon sun on the garage door at the moment, which you'll probably see in the very corner here. Um, so if I start to go red, it's just because I'm cooking. Uh, don't stress. It's just slowly getting roasted. Oh, dear. Well, There's only Jason generally an hour that it goes bad, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's Joseph, not good when it we, does. If we, if we add Joseph's overheating to my damp Melbourne basement underheating, we'll have the perfect temperature for both of us. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Then we'll end up with whatever Jason's dealing with right now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Look at those trees. I'm so jealous of those trees. A bit of green is so calming in these crazy times. Well, it's hit two o'clock, so I think we might sort of, we might, we might give it another minute or so and to see everybody sort of start to jump in. I said, I won't jump the gun too soon. But I've got some lovely trees outside that in winter, they they lose all their leaves and do the whole sort of baker thing. But I, I rarely see it do it because it's sort of you, you go to work and you come home and one minute they've got leaves and the next minute, you know, they're, they're in full on winter mode. So quite looking forward to seeing them shed their leaves and do all of that. I think it'll be quite fun. But we'll see. But I definitely think winter's on its way. The autumnal coolness is definitely there in the morning and in the evenings, I think. So, um, yeah. Okay. Well, I think we might sort of start to kick off and I'm sure everyone will join in their own times. So welcome, everyone. Welcome to the third edition of Think Inside the Square. I'm not responsible for that name or its acronym, but it's a little bit of fun if you want to have a little bit of fun with it. My name is Celia Pavelov, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at the Australia Council for the Arts. And, and once again, I'm your virtual MC um, for today. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. I, I come to you from the Eora Nation. And I'd like to acknowledge the many nations that not only our panellists come to you from, from around the country, but also that which you are joining us from online. I'd also like to acknowledge elders past and present and welcome any First Nations people who are online with us today. Um, this is the third session, as I said, in our two o'clock Facebook series on, on a Tuesday afternoon. And this week, when we were looking at the offerings of, of Council Ahead, we realised it was quite a digital smorgasbord. Um, our content is always digital on, on, in this particular space, but we have um, one of our colleagues also delivering um, a, some digital sessions in their Creative Connection sessions on Wednesday and Friday as well. 
So why digital and why digital is so important at the moment is because mother is the, sorry, necessity is the mother of all invention, as my mother would say. And she likes to say that a lot because it gets her mother thrown in there a lot. And I have to confess, I've been saying it a lot myself um, lately, particularly as we've all had to adapt and to evolve very, very quickly in this time. I was looking for some really interesting sayings around innovation to see if there was something coined um, similarly. Um, and the closest I got to something that I quite liked was a, a, a website called Success that said, you know the saying, nothing changes if nothing changes. Well, if nothing changes, we stay the same. We don't grow, we don't evolve, and we don't get better. And that's not going to work, not for you, not for the world. And clearly, I would say, not for the arts in 2020 as we're in COVID land at the moment. So today we're joined by another wonderfully generous panel to talk about platforms and innovation. Um, a little housekeeping before we take off, and this is where you'd normally talk about exits and toilets, but all I'll talk about is the little chat box today, which is on the bottom of your screen if you're in Zoom, if you have any questions, post them in there. And if you're joining us from Facebook, as we go out on Facebook Live as well, put them in the chat box and we'll curate those questions and get them back, um, try to answer them actually, as we go along. We also have closed captions on the bottom of the screen as well, if you would like to access them. Um, our panelists this week will spend a little 10 minutes or so with each of them and then come back for a combined chat at the end. If I am able to capture any questions as we go along that I can um, ask of the panelists at the time that they're actually, they're finishing their session, I, I will endeavour to do so. If not, I'll probably hold them till the end, just so that you know. So I think it's sort of, it's time to take off. So our first speaker today is Joseph Knox Wheeler from the Merch Desk coming to us from the Gold Coast. Uh, the Merch Desk is a new platform that um, Joseph created to support artists to move merchandise. He'll talk a little bit about the inspiration behind the Merch Desk, the tech and the business model. Over to you, Joseph. Thank you so much for having me. Um, well, before I get started, I think you said it best saying necessity is kind of, you know, how all invention starts um, in, in that uh, this project really started, I guess, just over three weeks ago. Um, as an idea. Um, a lot of artists, friends of mine, I wanted to support um, and I didn't have thousands of dollars to support them, but I wanted to purchase merch. I wanted to just do what I could to um, help them. I think um, a lot of artists are particularly hard hit just because even though their passion and their careers are in the arts, whether they're musicians or comedians, a lot of the time in between those moments of, you know, touring and things like that, um, they're also working in hospitality and all kinds of things. And, uh, you know, I've heard some really crushing stories from friends who have, you know, um, been working as baristas or, uh, you know, as cooks or all kinds of things um, who just weren't eligible for a lot of support during this time. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think there's any silver bullets here, but uh, basically after doing a bit of research and trying to find a solution for my artist's friends um i couldn't uh couldn't find anything so i decided to build it um <laughs> which was a bit of a crazy undertaking at the time but a, a few days later uh we um launched the merch desk so uh here we have it if you can see it here um celia that's coming through all right awesome so we've got uh the merch desk platform um and picture says a thousand words uh we had an amazing graphic illustrator in brisbane called jimmy patch do this up to try and help explain what i was trying to say in two thousand words and not necessarily conveying properly um basically how the merch desk works so we're here in the center is basically the platform an e-commerce platform that basically we work with artists to get their either existing designs up or create new designs with them to get merch happening um, basically all the artists that I was talking to would have a thousand different barriers to selling merch. Uh, the traditional approach to merch is, you know, you spend $800 to make a thousand dollars, um, which is all well and good if you've got that $800 in the bank. 
Um, but unfortunately, a lot of artists aren't in that position um, or it's too much of a risk uh, in these times, particularly just to, you know, put down the next few weeks rent um, to buy a bunch of shirts that may not move that quickly. Um, so that's where this originated. Uh, so we basically will help uh, design the merch, um, get it up online, um, sell the merch. And then we basically are very transparent with all the costs, send all of the profits through to the artists. Um, and then we take care of sending the merch through to the fans. Um, so basically all the artists really have to do in these instances is share their artist page um, and promote um, because these artists already have, you know, fans who love what they're doing, who want to support them desperately. Um, but unfortunately with far too many artists, it seems like unless I'm in a room with you, it, I can't support you. Um, and that's, that's a big challenge. Um, so we started originally just trying to work with a small handful of friends, um, who were musicians, um, and a couple of comedians, but that really quickly expanded. Um, in a few days, we had over 100 applications of artists coming through. Um, and as you can see here, you know, I've got on top of this probably another 100 uh, artists that I'm working with at the moment to get their merch live. Um, so it's all very, very exciting um, times for us, but obviously a bit crazy as well. Um, so, uh, that's, that's a basic premise of the concept, but we've been working with a whole lot of artists and lots of different people from different areas of the industry that we, uh, I didn't necessarily know how to help to start with. Um, for instance, uh, we've been working with a couple of venues who've always been avid supporters of the arts. We've always gone out of the way to pay artists, promote artists. Um, so we're working uh, with venues like that. We're working with labels, bookers, all kinds of things. Um, basically anyone who's affected by the gig economy. Um, we're really just trying to do whatever we can to break down any barriers that are there between people who are either supporting the arts or are artists themselves selling merch or getting support from the people who already love what they're doing. Um, and, th and that's, that's really, I guess, in essence, the most important thing for us is um, for a lot of these artists, they, I guess, don't feel necessarily empowered um, or they may be amazing, amazing, technically incredibly proficient artists at what they do. Um, but if you're not tech savvy and you don't have money already in the bank, it can be really, really challenging to kind of take that next step, get merch out. Um, and, you know, even artists who have merch can be really challenging to then obviously get that merch, take it out, you know, actually post it. That's potentially a high risk activity for artists who are um, just coming off tour internationally, who are in quarantine, all kinds of things. It's just so many barriers. Um, there's, you know, hundreds of different barriers I've heard over the next, last couple of weeks. Um, but in essence, that's, that's the merch desk. That's what we're doing. Sorry, just took me a second that, to unmute myself. That's all right. I was a little bit slow at the moment. Have you found that there is quite a, a demand for, for merch as we've gone into COVID or have people actually held back a little bit from from that side of thing and changed their focus to areas, other areas of their practice? No, I, as, as uh, we were doing the introduction, I had three separate order emails come through for merch for different artists. Um, there's, there's a big demand. People really want to help. Um, I was, I was, would have been very, very happy just helping the 10 or so friends that I, you know, really wanted to help, even if it just meant that I could purchase their merch. Um, but no, there's been huge demand for merch. Um, we're looking at, uh, we've got big plans to expand the range and also, Realistically, our, our end goal isn't to sell shirts. Um, we're not printers. Um, you know, we're teaming up with local businesses yeah. um, to, you know, support Australian business on the other side as well. That's another huge part for us. Um, so our, our biggest goal is just to support the artists. So where that may be really important, you know, T-shirt, that means T-shirts right now. And obviously with Oz T-shirt day last week, that was, you know, a really 
crazy time for us. But um, moving forward, it's going to mean a whole range of things um, and open us up to a whole range of different ways that we're going to be able to help artists. Yeah, cool. There's a question from Fiona Duncan, Joseph. Um, who pays the upfront costs of manufacturing? Brilliant question. So we actually work on a print on demand model, which basically means that you can design any merch and then you, uh, nothing actually happens until the merch is ordered. Um, so for instance, uh, as a piece of merch is ordered um, through the site, that will then get sent through to currently we're working with the print bar in Brisbane um, who have just been an amazing business, jumping right on board, um, helping in any way we can. Um, and then uh, that will then get sent straight from the print bar outwards. So basically that cost then comes from the sale. So there's no upfront cost for anyone really. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Other than my time. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really important because I think, you know, with so many conversations at the moment around the sustainability of individual sole traders and small organisations, that it's important that we remember that the work between artists and small and medium organisations is vital and that relationship is vital to support each other and especially sustaining that business during this particular time. So we've been reminded that your, your website is themerchdesk.com.au. So yep. supporting Australian businesses is vital at, at the moment, as is supporting as a, um, Australian artists and their yep. organisations. Um, another question for you from Amy Matthews is, how does it work for artists who don't have merchandise? Um, and the second part of her question is, do the fans outlay cash first and then the merch gets created as another potential business model? Because I think, you know, understanding value monetization and how you build that into your business model, um, whether it's video content, merchandise, you know, it's a lovely thread through today's conversation that Jason yeah. will pick up on when we, we sort of go here. But to, just to come back to your question, to that question, how does it work for artists who don't have merch and uh, do the fans outlay that cash first? Great. So uh, first of all, for the artists who don't have merch at all, um, which is, to be honest, the majority of artists that we're working with at the moment, um, that's a combination of things. For artists that don't have any designs, they don't have logos, they don't have album artwork or anything like that, they have no visual representation of them. Uh, we actually, once again, teamed up with uh, Jimmy Patch, who did that illustration I showed you before. Mm -hmm. And he, he's actually been doing designs for artists, basically just volunteering his time to help wherever he can. But um, outside of you know, that, we're also having heaps of visual artists and graphic designers step forward, go, I'm lucky enough to be in a situation where I'm still employed. I would love to donate some time and help. Um, but we've got other artists who are working off profit share models. So uh, for instance, um, they're stepping in and going, okay, you know, I'm, I'm not employed right now. So I also need to draw an income from this. How about I do the designs for you and, you know, $1 from each shirt we sell goes back to them. So it's a viable model, artists helping artists. Um, in regards to uh, the second question of fans outlaying the cost. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, it does work that way in a sense, but realistically, it's, it's not quite like that just because of the turnaround. Um, we had people last week ordering on a Wednesday or Thursday um, before Oz T-shirt day, and they were getting uh, the shirts on Friday. So oh. from a fan, fan point of view, um, they're actually you know, receiving it faster than you would if you were to order through H&M online. Um, so it's not, it, it's not uh, a crowdfunding model. It's not a, I'm going to dedicate $30 and then in 18 months get a product. Um, yeah. The side for the fans, um, we've really tried to actually give the best user experience for the fans better than um, they would generally get from purchasing direct from a band or um, actually a lot of clothing stores as well. Cool. And planning two days ahead in COVID land is very impressive, I have to say. Anybody who can think on Wednesday for something on Friday is like mind-bogglingly amazing and gold started them at this, this point in time. <laughs> and very last question. We do have a couple more questions for you, but if we don't get them answered in, in the session today, we'll, we'll sh shoot them your way a little bit later on. Of course. On. Yep. Um, 
So Joe, when you mean merch for performers, do you mean just t-shirts or selling performance clips as well? What are, what's the, the spectrum of merchandise? Sure. So uh, obviously when Triple J brought forward the Oz t-shirt day, that was a bit of a, um, a great, great status to wake up to. But also I, uh, I realized I wasn't going to get sleep for a couple of weeks. Um, so that was a big focus for us to start with. Uh, we were focusing on products that would, we could just do a really fast turnaround with. Um, but to be perfectly honest, we're open to any form of merch. Um, our goal is just to support artists and support local business. So if it's a, we're working with comedians to actually sell access to gig clips. Mm -hmm. Um, we're working with a number of artists to sell some really unique merch, which I'm so excited to announce in the next couple of weeks. Um, again, supporting local businesses and supporting artists. Um, there's going to be some stuff uh, coming in the next, you know, month or so that um, I honestly don't think you'd be able to buy anywhere else in the world um, for artists, but they're also just cool things that you would love to have um, in your possession as well. Um, so yeah, the sky's the limit. Um, as long as it's helping artists and, you know, also um, helping local business and things like that, we are just making it happen. Great. So that means that at two o'clock in a couple of weeks time, I'll see you pop up in the little box telling us what those really cool <laughs> are and pointing us, us to them. So I'll look forward well, to that. Now we've got a deadline. Now we've got a deadline. Okay. Yeah, you do. Two o'clock on a Tuesday. I mean, where else Done. would you want to be? Seriously. Done. So Jason, over to you now. So Jason Rao from Bright Cove is going to talk to us about video platforms as an alternative method to other video, his video platform as opposed to other video platforms such as YouTube and Vimeo and how to monetize that video content. There was a lot of videos in that. I'm sorry, I caught my, yeah, over to you. Oh, no, unmute. Thank you very much, Celia. I appreciate that. Um, thanks for the opportunity as well to give a brief overview of, of Brightcove, but also more importantly, how uh, an organisation or a sole trader can look to leverage the power of video to help with um, awareness, uh, conversion, or um, also uh, brand loyalty as well. Um, just on Brightcove, um, we're a company that's headquartered in, in Boston, Massachusetts, but the team here in Sydney, we've got a, a strong team of 30 that is based um, in our Sydney office. Uh, and we're looking after customers ranging from uh, media broadcasters and publishers. So if you're watching video content on 7, 9 and 10's website, that's all powered by Brightcove. Um, also brands like Tourism Australia or Visit Victoria also leverage Brightcove for their, their marketing uh, as well. Um, and we've got a couple of um, art examples as well with uh, Sydney Symphony Orchestra as well, leveraging the platform for, for video on demand. Um, I'm going to share my screen and uh, look to uh, run through a few slides as well. So just bear with me while I do that. It's working. Thank you. Um, and so the first thing we like to, to think about uh, from a, a video standpoint is what is ultimately your goal or purpose for, for using video? I talked before about brand awareness as one Maybe it's to help with increasing engagement, uh, conversion, uh, monetizing content, which is what I'm going to focus a little bit on as part of this presentation as well. But ultimately, what are you looking to achieve and how can you look to measure that as well as an end result uh, using video? Um, I wanted to focus this first part with relation to the high cost of free. So obviously, there are a lot of options out there to be able to help distribute uh, your message through video. Uh, and in particular, uh, free video platforms such as YouTube are a great way to help with that initial brand awareness. Uh, I wanted to focus a little bit on that um, before I, I talk a little bit more about options using a, a platform like Brightcove. Um, and there are some upside to using uh, free video tools. So I talked before about audience and, uh, and awareness as part of those particular platforms. Uh, YouTube in particular is seen as the, the second biggest search engine uh, after Google itself. So it's a great way if you're looking at that initial awareness uh, to be able to um, showcase your brand or what you're looking to, to promote. Also from a, a video search ranking, uh, YouTube obviously comes up quite well in, in Google search results. And there's a great community and social aspect to, to YouTube and free video platforms as well that helps with uh, engagement and, and communication with your brand. 
When it comes to the, the downside, as, as an example, uh, looking at the, the page for, for Hugo Boss, there is here an example where it's promoting related uh, channels, but in fact, these are competitors of, of Hugo Boss as well. So the, the, the main uh, risk, I guess, with YouTube or free video tools is the potential where it's promotion of other content that uh, isn't relevant to your brand, but also can take people off uh, your brand or away from your website, which is, which is not an area that you want to be focusing on. Um, there's also the, the lack of branding that you have with respect to uh, using free video tools as well. Um, and also the lack of monetization access that comes with, um, with channels such as, as YouTube too. So in terms of trying to engage your audience uh, with a, a free video platform, uh, sorry, with a professional video platform, uh, we've got two examples around live and, and video on demand that can look to, to help with that. Um, the first one is with respect to uh, looking at how live streaming can help drive engagement and participation. So in particular here, uh, in terms of um, live streaming, uh, when we did an initial uh, enterprise survey um, of uh, our customers and, and the public, 61% uh, came back to say that they enjoyed the ability to interact in real time with live stream video. So an example here, obviously, uh, with the, the presentations that we've got today, we're obviously able to engage freely and openly um, and in real time through the Q&A and, um, and, and chat options that we have here as well. So using live as a way to drive participation and engagement with your, with your site or brand or what you're looking to promote um, is a great way of doing that. Um, with, with respect to Brightcove, uh, we've got a, a, a live solution that um, allows for um, high quality live streaming and also can work to support streaming out not only to your website, but if you do want to continue with that awareness and reach aspect of, of live through uh, free video platforms, we can also support pushing that out to, to YouTube and Facebook. The other aspect to it as well is uh, being able to create a video on demand version after a live event as well. There's a, a great halo effect with respect to live in that after an event is finished, there's a way to be able to promote that content after the fact and get people coming back to your site or where you want them to engage with you with more video on demand content as well. Um, and, and with respect to um, Brightcove Live, we can also provide real-time video analytics as part of that so you can see the viewership numbers um, and then further down the track with video on demand, look at the engagement for that video content as well. An example that we've had with a customer is with Cisco, who's using live for webinars and also events as well. Um, and we also look at integrating with uh, CRM systems as well. So that can help to be able to provide individual uh, viewer analytics into a CRM system like Salesforce or Marketo so that you can understand individual viewer performance and analytics through those platforms as well. And this is just a, a screenshot of how that uh, looked from, from their event perspective, the, the main focus there being the video content. Uh, but then on the right hand side is where there was a Q&A session as part of that particular live stream. And uh, viewers are able to vote on questions that may be popular uh, to the audience as well as uh, other areas of interactivity such as uh, polling or surveys um, as part of the platform as well. There's another aspect to our, our platform called Gallery, uh, which allows you to be able to, to launch uh, these portal-like experiences that can be branded uh, and hosted um, by Brightcove as well. Um, so that allows for a consistent brand experience, uh, being able to include your logo or look and feel to, to suit your website um, without having to, to lose that by using a free video platform such as, as YouTube, for example. Um, and there are a range of options in terms of templates uh, that we can look to, uh, to provide as part of that as well. So we've got a, a live chat experience um, that we showed before, but then also there is that video on demand uh, portal option as well that we can uh, look to provide a couple of examples on later on. From a live perspective, uh, we have three different states as part of that. So a pre-event state, which can help you to be able to promote an event or a particular live experience uh, beforehand, get people to be aware that the event is happening and, and be able to set reminders for that. 
Uh, during the event, obviously, it's focused on the video itself, but then the support for, for Q&A and also go back into uh, the live stream if they come in late. And then post-event is focused on, well, how do you look to then further engage your viewers after the event as well? So there's the ability to be able to offer the video on demand or other clips related to, to what you've um, published there before as well. CES is a large event that we um, that is run in, in Las Vegas each year and, and they've used Brightcurve to be able to support that for uh, a range of live streams across their event, um, as well as embedding video across other websites to help with the reach and syndication as well. So that's another aspect that, that might be of interest uh, to the audience here is obviously you've got your, your own operated website or a destination that you want people to go to, but you can also share and syndicate your live event or video on demand content uh, to other people to be able to promote and also publish on their sites as well. And that's just an example of the, the gallery template that was used for this particular event. One local customer is the, the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. Uh, and so if you go to, to watch.sydneysymphony.com, that will help in uh, going to their video on demand portal that they've got. Um, and at this stage, they're uh, providing um, a particular uh, events that, are, that have been showcased throughout the, the year and, and last year, uh, available on demand for people to be able to watch in their own time as well. And so they've got this great gallery experience that provides all of the content uh, available to, uh, to the audience uh, within their website to be able to help with the engagement and also promote other content as well. I wanted to talk a little bit quickly about monetization here too. So uh, we talked about ways to help with engagement and awareness, but there's also ways to monetize your live streaming or video on demand uh, as well through, through the Brightcurve platform. So we have customers that look to leverage um, either sort of a subscription model where they can pay monthly uh, for access to the content, or if you're looking at a transactional approach where it's more of a, a pay-per-view or a one-time event, uh, there are, there's options there with our partners to be able to help with uh, transactional uh, payments through, through the platform. Um, other options is around advertising. So uh, a lot of our customers look to leverage pre, mid or post role advertising within events or video on demand content. And then lastly, there's sponsorship or branded video experiences that we can help our customers promote as well. So if you've got a particular brand or organization on board, uh, you can use them as a way to help with sponsorship of the particular event as a way to monetize the, the content that you're producing as well. If you want to learn more about that, we're happy to answer some questions as part of the, the chat, but also I've got my email address there if you wanted to send anything direct to me to, to help with how we can uh, look to support your business. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. I've got a question. We do have a question from Jackie, but I've got a question just first. Yeah, are there patterns to the pay per view? Because I know that all of like that's been quite a quick response for the arts and cultural sector to get their content up. And I've noticed that some people, some organisations, artists are choosing to put the options there for people to actually opt to pay or to to actually view or to download or to receive that content free of charge. And I just wondered, has there been a trend over time? What sort of patterns emerge from that? And having those kind of options to pay or not to pay, is that, is that useful? And does yeah. that then, does that set you up to, for a devalued model in, in the future or does it indeed do the opposite? Does it actually build value with your audience and that relationship with your audience to value your product in the future? That's right. Yeah, I think it definitely can help in, in both ways in terms of building that initial brand and awareness, uh, offering the content. Uh, available for free is a, is a great way of doing that. Um, outside of transactional, the other sort of approach that um, organizations have looked to, to implement as well is around donations as well. So being able to um, allow for people to pay whatever they feel is uh, worthy for the content or what they would like to donate to an organization uh, rather than setting a particular value for content. They're also offering uh, sort of donation type uh, approaches as well that provides the ability for someone to put any sort of nominal cost or what they would want to contribute to the organization rather than setting a, a nominal fee for that for that particular experience as well. 
Yeah, because I, I think it's one of the really important um, conversation at the moment, starters and, and the, con, the, the things that we need to be talking about is even just how you value that, the difference of the value from the experience and, and how you then translate that value and then what, like even the, the question of if I charge this when I was actually in a venue when you were experiencing this particular work, and then when I bring this experience to you online, should I be charging you around the same, about the same? How do I work out that value? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great question. It's, it's going to depend on obviously on the content and how much you value that. Uh, we see a lot with respect to uh, sports content as well. Um, that's an area of high value where people are happy to pay a bit more of a premium for um, because of the experience uh, being in your own home to be able to, to access the content. But I think it just comes down to, to what you're looking to promote uh, and also um, what, what you associate with, with the brand, whether you want to see it more as a, as a free uh, promotional option for you or you're actually looking at it as a way to be able to help uh, with, with monetization. So it just depends on where you're at. Mm -hmm. This one's a, this is Jackie's question and then it, it might be a little tricky, might not be. Um, Zoom, I know Zoom's been in the media a lot lately, so this isn't a, 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 a comparison in, in that sort of sense. Um, but how, what, what's perhaps the differences between Brightcove Live and, and doing Zoom so that um, it then enables people to make their own decision about one platform over another, whether one is better or different or what yep. suits them? We've actually had uh, customers uh, leverage Zoom in combination with, with Brightcurve Live. So um, where we see the advantage for our platform is around the, the security. Uh, so we have different methods of uh, security um, or authorization as part of our platform as well, especially when it comes to sort of internal communications. There's the ability to integrate uh, our platform with a, a single sign-on solution or IP restriction. Um, there's also the scale of our platform as well. So we have events that can run, that can uh, create a high amount of concurrent viewership. Uh, and we're talking about tens of thousands up to, to millions from a concurrency perspective there. Um, so there's the sort of scalability of the platform. And then I think the other aspect to it is around the post event experience. So uh, being able to convert a live stream to video on demand, but also separate clips from a live stream as well. So it's not the whole event, but you may want to slice that into chapters or four or five different clips that you can then look to distribute uh, elsewhere. Um, those are some of the, the, the top level sort of differences or advantages as part of using Zoom in combination with Brightcove or Brightcove separately. Just picking up on the point of concurrent viewers, Jason has asked, is the number of concurrent viewers restricted for the pay per view option? Uh, no, no, I think um, uh, I'd have to, to look at that from a, a solution perspective, but from a, a Brightcove point of view, we don't sort of limit that or look to have a, a limit on concurrent viewers for a particular event, um, depending on what you're looking to do from a, a transactional or business model perspective, that, that might be a little bit different depending on the requirements, but from the platform point of view, we don't, we don't say that there's a particular restriction there on concurrency. Okay, well, thanks, Jason. I think we might switch over to Susan now. So if you've got any more questions, I think they're, it's an incredibly, um, like it's another way that the monetization, the value, the, the small to, to medium and the larger size businesses are all supporting each other and finding new ways to work together quite quickly. So we'll whoop over to Susan, whose son did a tuba exam a little earlier today, which made me very nervous, but I'm calming down about that fact now because music exams clearly have had a big impact on my life. Um, so Susan's going to walk us through design thinking and the things to consider as you navigate the online space and create your own digital content. She's here to help us think radically. So over to you, Susan. Thanks, Celia. Um, and thanks, Celia, Renee, and the Australia Council team for facilitating these really valuable conversations. I'm sure all of us on the call have dialed into lots of really useful support in the last couple of weeks. Um, so I wanted to approach this from a strategic point of view um, to allow you, the, the viewers, to think about how the tools like Brightcove or Merch Desk might be, might be used and applied when um, we have to innovate. Um, and I think that when, particularly coming at it from 
my background, which is a, um, from the very conservative world of classical music, um, when the normal platforms that we use are unavailable, uh, the way we normally deliver and experience our art form is unavailable, and our art form may or may not may or may not be suitable in the way we've been delivering it for simply putting it online. Um, so I wanted to sort of challenge you to think about if you're on this call, regardless of where you are, whether you're a sole practitioner as an artist or whether you're part of a small or a large organisation as to how you can be part of leading regardless of the chair that you're sitting in, in your organisation. Um, and to take an opportunity to help get not just to the next best thing, you know, not just to posting some stuff online, not just to what might be possible, given what we know from with our biases and the traditions of, of the art form that we're coming from, not even to what might be possible, but, but to get us to a point where we can start to think about, well, imagine if, imagine if paper clips were 10 foot tall. Why does a paper clip have to be small? What, to think really radically about what we're doing. And in terms of putting that in an organisational context is starting to think about, um, so Celia, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, just making sure the sound was okay. It's to start from the point of um, what what is your organisation or if you're a sole practitioner, what is your creative practice really about? What's it really about? Like we might think, um, if we were to use the example, of an orchestra that it, we might think it's about playing concerts or making music but it's really not we're really in the business of transforming others through a creative practice so how can we think much more broadly about not what we do but what we're about and how we can start to transform others so in, so if we were to use the example of say an orchestra um, how do we get from we play concerts to we create experiences that make people better through music. And that then becomes a strategy that we can activate lots of different um, component parts underneath. Or even better, imagine if um, we were able to become mission-driven organisations. So not only do we have the, our job is to transform others and make others better through music, but also, we, you know, if, if our community really cares about humanitarian stories or climate change, that we're a creative organisation that transforms others through our art form with a focus on humanitarian stories. And that then may be the future for our organisation. We can get away from the delivery, focus on the delivery, and get above the superstructure of, of what is our organisation really about? Um, because we get stuck in the traditions and convention of what we have done and we get um, stuck in a little box of the history and the combined knowledge of the people who care very passionately about what we do um, but that's kind of it's struggling many of our organizations to be able to get above above the medium they're stuck on, stuck on the music or, st or stuck on the art instead of what is our organization and, and the people within it what are we for who do we serve and how do we transform them. And I think that's a really, that should really be a starting point for us of um, the imaginative conversation when the thing we used to do is not possible and may not be possible again. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, um, if the thing we do is not possible anymore and the thing we used to do is not suitable in the method, in the way we used to deliver it to a digital experience, what might be possible for us? That will enable us, will enable the leaders of our art for a hundred years from now to look back and say there was great vision in the leadership of that organisation and they really took our art form into this flourishing new generation um, that hundred years that we have now instead of um, being stuck in models that were really inefficient for the artists. Um, uh, people were exhausted, like the way we have been operating for too long now in, in our industry is too much demand on people, underpaid, overworked, um, struggling to make ends meet from art, from even from the majors right through the independent artists. How can we forward think 100 years from now about the um, possibility that we can enact now to get us there? So I think in order to do this, in order to think really radically and think about transformation, um, we're going to need to be flexible about what the future might be 
for all of us and not just think about adapting or pivoting, but to actually think radically about new ways that our, that the arts might operate. Like I said, maybe we maybe there's there's ways that we can incorporate a mission focus. And we are very clearly an organization that does a thing for people really clearly. And I think as you mentioned Celia at the beginning about design and thinking, how do we start everything from the perspective of who is this for? And that driving all of our decisions, putting the audience first, who is this for? Like one thing I would love to see is some of our um, organisations uh, posting loads of content, but is that driven from, is there data and strategy behind that? Have they gone to their audiences and asked what they want? Have they segmented their CRM data to see who they want to engage more with, who's likely to be more engaged in this digital space and ask them, what is the content you want to see from us? And also, what are you not missing anymore? You know, maybe the answers might surprise us. The things that we held really dear, that we thought they wanted, were things that they really don't care too much about. So how can we, you know, use some data around this once we've got the who is it for to be able to drive our decision making forward. Um, and we're at a place now, um, particularly in my neck of the woods where things have been very traditional and very conservative, is that superficial changes are not going to help us. Um, it's not a way to building a, a future where everybody is flourishing in six months or 12 months or 24 months. Innovation is not just changing packaging. It's not simply putting content online that was not really created to be shared digitally. Maybe this stuff was really created more from an archival purpose. Um, so these little superficial changes about redesigning the project or product or simply saying we're going online, it's not innovation and it's not transformation. Um, so we really need to be thinking about how, how can our art form be relevant and meaningful and embed us in our community um, in a way that we are going to be here and thriving in a hundred years time, not just sort of some quick solutions to try and um, process nature our way through. So that's my 10 cents worth on innovation transformation. And I would love to hear from, um, uh, from our audience uh, if they have any questions or comments about transforming an innovation. Uh, I'm just coming back. I'm back. <laughs> we were turning everything off because it was a little bit bubbly. So I I'm do. I'm so sorry. No, no, it's okay. This this happens, and I think there's it's quite a congested time. I think on the wires all around the country at this particular time of the day for um for connectivity period. I think, um, Susan, you really hit the nail on the head when in your um in your first part of of your your presentation then when you were talking about it's not just about the performance, it's not just about going to hear an orchestra, but it's about what that transformative experience does making us better or, or whatever it is and I think if there is one thing that unites and connects all of us I mean the word connectivity has been used a lot we use it a lot it, it's our mission it's our driving vision that creativity connects us but I actually think you've taken it to to another and we've, we've talked about experiences and other other sorts of things as well but I think if we were all to recognise and acknowledge what that means, that that experience makes us better, the strength of that argument is as important as finding the solution to the pandemic that we're in at the moment and solution to the economic situation that we've now found ourselves in as a result of the, the health situation. So there's all sorts of things to that, I think. It's quite... It's a very important advocacy message, I think, if you would, if you agree. Mm, yeah, and I think it's it's a lot of the um, a lot of the problem we have in some of the more conservative elements. Uh, I'm sorry, is my sound still quite jumpy? No, that's much better. That was better. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think a lot of you know a lot of the challenges that our more conservative elements of the arts are finding is because they are for themselves. The art is being made for. It's for, for you know, for, uh, and I'm, I'm not meaning to rag on orchestras because they it's, it's where my heart lives. Um, but it seems like as someone who's a fan of the art form, the decisions are being made for the 
th there doesn't seem to be an, uh, necessarily an audience um, perspective. Like, is this who is this who is this being made for, and is the experience relevant in the year 2020? A lot of the conventions are still very similar to the way this art form was being delivered 50 or 60 years ago, yet we're in, you know, digital 2.0 age now. And what our audience was want from us is our art form, but delivered in a way that's designed to come across a digital, on, on a digital platform or to be compelling to the tastes that we have today. And a lot of the d delivery hasn't been, and that's what's been shown up now um, in this switch to digital is that there isn't the content that's being um, made to be shared uh, in a relevant context digitally. We're just, um, yeah, we're sharing stuff that looks like it was made for archival purposes. So there's a really great opportunity for our performing arts organisations to think about, um, you yeah, know, particularly now in, in creating content and sharing content is perhaps um, posting performances is not the only thing that we might be able to do who, what are the other um, skills that our artists may have um, that we can use them to be um, creating different content? Maybe there's someone within our organisation, you know, if you were uh, one of the circus providers, circus people, um, maybe someone within one of your circus performers also has a science degree. So imagine if they curated some content for you around um, science and circus performance and shared and kind of did, did a beautiful mashing of those two things together. So I think there's also lots of ways of thinking about what is the purpose of this organisation and who, what are all the skills that the people within it have and how can we use them in really flexible ways? Yeah, and I think I, I, I would agree with you. And I think there's something else in um, the, the phrase that you, that you just offered then as well about the content that's been put online um, and that it essentially is designed for a real world experience or a, you know a person to a physical experience and that we've in many cases rushed very quickly to put that online because that's what we have and that's you know that's what we're scrambling for and in, in many ways that's what this group started to answer questions around and about um, and it's appropriate that that conversation then evolves to mod uh, transforming that um, online experience or whatever that content is to something else that we may not know what that is yet. Like we might, that might be something that in five or six months time has had that exploration from someone like if there was someone in uh, the team or your organisation with a different skill set to realise something different. So I think this is the opportunity in this moment that's been given to us as opposed to the challenge, which I think, I think they are, they always to me, come hand in hand. The minute you've got a challenge, you've also got the opportunity. I don't mm -hmm. see one without the other. Um, and also using our, I mean, coming from a human-centred design perspective, our our major organisations have a tr have tremendous um, CRM data. So how can they segment their CRM data and ask their audience, what is it that you want from us in this moment? And they may say please don't post another replay of a concert of music from a hundred years ago. Um, we would really like to know how does your tuba player practice when he lives in an apartment? So how do we, how do we put our audience's needs at the center of the content that we're creating right now? Because at the moment it looks like we're, po we're posting what we want um, rather than maybe saying to our audience, we're going to take a week off to, or, or, or our hardworking digital comms team have um, been working so hard in the last couple of weeks to keep you nourished musically. They need a little bit of time off. And what we're going to do is send out some um, survey to ask you what you want from us. And we're going to come back in a week or two's time with a whole fabulous new suite of stuff we've made just for you based on what you said you wanted from us. So putting this, the, the human experience and the needs of our audience at the center of the platforms we're using, like Jason's platform or Joseph's platform, um, and using those as tools to serve our audience rather than starting from a, what do I, what do I want to create? Starting from a, what do I need? What does, so what does my audience need? Who are they? And how do we create a transformative experience in a digital space? And it's interesting that you mentioned needs. Um, there's a, some lovely messages coming through from Karen and, um, Louise and I think Jackie had some other things in there as well um, about artists being able to, to take risks but at the same mm -hmm. time which is their need too at the same mm -hmm. time as the audience's need 
and being able to express that. And I think it's this lovely combination of all of these things that create the other space perhaps or the, or the other dimension. Um, there's another question here from Louise King. Any examples of potential transformational art experiences in digital forms or delivery um, that you've seen that, that you could speak to? I haven't from a performing point of view, from a performing point of view, but I have um, obviously from Stage Kings who, who we've all um, seen their fantastic pivot. Um, they, from where Stage Kings looked at what, what are the resources that we, what are the skills and resources that our organisation has to hand and what do people need right now? And they found that those two things met in uh, um, standing workstations and, and perspex screens. So I'm sure you can go and check out Stage Kings. So I, I ha but I haven't seen anything in it from a performing arts point of view. But one of the things, um, and um, Louise has asked also about the funding for this, is how do we create a solution that people need um, that's, that's mission driven, that solves a problem, but where the um, people who are receiving it aren't necessarily the ones who are paying. And a great example that I I use is to say, imagine if our um, opera and orchestra, our performing arts companies, opera, opera and orchestra companies, paired with music therapists, and they also then went to say, Bupa, the health insurers, and then they worked with Public Transport Victoria, and there was a co-production where the music therapy people um, worked with the, um, say, tram drivers who'd experienced trauma in the workplace. And they came up with a program um, and the, uh, of music that the performers might be able to um, record. And that's provided as a curated playlist funded by Bupa as their healthcare provider as part of their mental health program. So, oh, the, so the, peop the people receiving the benefit are not the ones paying for it. It's, it's meeting a need and solving a problem. So I think this issue of where is the funding, if we can think about putting the human experience of transformation and then look at where, where are the unexpected pockets of money that sit around that, that doesn't mean that the person that is on the, on the receiving end of the art practice is necessarily the one having to pay for it because it's ticking a couple of boxes. So for instance, you end up, we, we work with Ambulance Victoria and there's a um, Bupa and um, Sydney Symphony Orchestra Spotify playlist, uh, which has been developed in conjunction with music therapists and it's for ambulance and paramedics to listen to on their way home after their shift to help them de-stress and get ready in the transition between, you know, trauma in the workplace and kids at home. So everybody would get paid, the artists would get paid, um, the people would be able to receive this without, without them having to pay for it. So it's reducing that barrier and it's being funded for under, under a mental health umbrella. Thanks, Susan. That was really interesting. And I think, because there was a little bit of choppiness, I think I'll talk with Renee and see if there's a way that we can get a transcript or um, the, uh, the, the written version of, of what you were sharing with everyone. Because I think there were some lovely messages in, in there. So I'm just going to throw a question to the panel to have 30 seconds to think about while I do the rounding up housekeeping. But panel, if you were to share with the um, with the attendees of the um, of the session an idea uh, uh, that the one of the most innovative things that you've seen or experienced or an idea or a concept just in the last little while the last four, five, six weeks that you could um, proffer to the group as, as an idea or, or a suggestion that they might want to explore or that they might want to look up or that they might want to think about that may not have been thought about or that you might have a question about yourself as the kind of the leaving everybody with that tiny little bit of a provocation. So I'll leave that with you to have a little think about. So the house, the, just to round up for the end of the day, um, don't forget that we have the Creative Connections webinars. All the details are on our website. They're scheduled all the way through until July um, or so. We have our weekly um, session here on Think Inside the Square, and we'd love for you to continue to share with your colleagues and networks and to bring to us um, your ideas. And if you'd like to be a pa panel member, please 
send us an email at digital solutions at australiacouncil.gov.au and we'll come back to you and we'll keep working on next week's topics. We tend to use your questions um, and your ideas and your conversations to inspire us for the panel for the following week so that we are answering in the moment of the issue that has come up at the moment because they're changing from week to week. And the, as you can probably guess, the very first week it was about live streaming and everyone was just going live stream, live stream, live stream. So we're sort of trying to actually work through all of those questions and issues that you may have. Um, don't forget that on Friday at 2 till 3.30, we have the First Nations Round Tables. Um, which is a very important conversation. So ensure that you and your communities are also sharing that opportunity. Um, and our new Instagram um, stream, which goes in some way to all of the different work of the panelists at the moment. It's somewhere to actually promote your work, to talk about your work, if that meets your need or your audience's need. It's somewhere we can actually ask the audiences once the audiences start to propagate it a little bit more about what they would like to experience. What's the gap? What, what are they missing out of their life to answer that question? What are they, what don't they have um, coming to them at the moment? But it does, it will take a sharing and it will, will will grow and be an incredibly rich um, opportunity there once we get a few more people having having a little bit of a play in, in that space as well. Um, so I think they're the main things I have to, to say. Thank you to all the panellists for your time today. We're very, very grateful because um, it, it is a very quick turnaround to put this thing on and the, the team at the end at the background, I'd like to say thank you as well. And Renee has just sent me a message. Any unanswered questions, we'll pass on at the back to the panel and we'll get those questions answered for you. So I think I've kicked off with Renee. I think I've done all my jobs. So starting with Joseph, what would be your thing that you would suggest? It's, it's a tough one. I've seen a lot of, you know, so many things happening fast pace in the uh, last few weeks. But um, probably two examples. Uh, I've seen some artists who have really... Again, that whole going, okay, challenge opportunity. Um, and a lot of artists just looking for any way to diversify their income. Um, so this is their chance to, uh, you know, whether they're collaborating or anything like that, um, they're also just getting money in the bank to then, as soon as they can get back into a studio, um, they've got money to run with uh, some amazing local bands like Void. Um, I'd so switched on when it comes to this. Um, they're incredibly just, you know, great with their marketing, their PR, everything. And they've got fans globally who are just getting stuck in to fund it. Um, the only other thing I'd say is I've seen a bunch of local uh, businesses who run events. One in particular runs uh, some custom acrylic jewelry workshops, um, which is a very hands-on um, very, very hands-on experience. Um, and they've built up fans across Australia um, and beyond. Um, they're called Laser Unicorn. And they've just started making do-it-yourself at-home kits. Um, they send it off to people. Uh, and then they are in person, uh, sorry, not in person, obviously, uh, but via webinars and things, having sessions. So even though there's instructions in the box, it's all, you know, a lot of the time they know what they need to do. There's a lot of you know, mix of extroverts and introverts in that group who love just dialing in just to feel connected there. Um, so yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things that a lot of people uh, really need when we talk about supply and demand, a lot of people need human connection right now. Um, so, you know, whether it's these webinars or just anything we can do to kind of, you know, provide that, um, I think that's, you know, as, as much as it's a good thing, it's also a product. Thank you. Jason? Uh, well, outside of the looking at sort of obviously moving everything to digital and sort of the transactional type business models, there's also other forms of interactive content which are starting to surface as well. So, for example, like 360 video that helps to be able to explore a space that obviously might not be accessible now or choose your own adventure style video content as well that helps to be able for people to explore different avenues or journeys that they may be interested in, in looking into um, and other forms of interactivity um, as part of video content as well, like uh, hotspotting particular parts of a video or making that interactive as a way to help continue with engagement and also conversion as well. Cool. Thank you. Susan. Um, 
I really love and want to say thank you to Joseph for what you are doing as someone with a very clear, who is it for? <laughs> How do I help them? Do they need it enough that they will reach in their pocket and pay dollars right now? You have nailed it. So that's been your, your story of what you are giving to others. And so, and so that everybody can thrive um, was really inspiring. So I just, that's really like made me super happy today. So thank you for the opportunity to hear about that. I'm in a very hot garage on the Gold Coast right now. And previously I was red from the heat, but now it's just blushing, just to clarify. <laughs> Well, I think that might wrap us up for today. Thank you, everybody, for a very generous session. And I think that was um, a very beautiful conversation. So thank you. There was so much in that today. So same time next week. And Joseph, I'm going to hold you to it in a couple of weeks' time to come and tell us what some of those ideas were. I want to see you in this little... I've got two little white boxes here in my little control panel. So, all right. I've got a deadline. I've got a deadline you got a now. Deadline. You certainly thank have you a deadline. so much. <laughs> Ciao. Everybody. Thank you.